All right, very good. Well, I, I'm delighted today to welcome a longtime friend, uh, Aziz Asfahani, to speak with us. Uh, I, I've known Aziz since he and I were both um, graduate students. He was at MIT and I, I was at Ohio State, but we've known each other for, well, like Aziz, I guess they'd say a few years, <laughs> maybe more than a few years. <laughs> But today, uh, Aziz is chairman and CEO of a, a company called Quest Tech Innovations, which is in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, he's going to talk to us about compute, computational materials design and engineering. And let, let me just put a little bit of perspective on that. You know, we, we spoke a couple of weeks ago in one of our meetings about uh, machine learning and some of the uh, concerns about uh, chat GPT, for example. But I have personally, I have very high hopes and expectations for machine learning uh, if it's applied properly, especially to science and engineering. But that, that caveat of applied properly is the key to all of this. And today you're going to hear uh, about the work done at Quest Tech, uh, which supersedes the traditional trial and error approach to finding new materials for advanced engineering systems. You know what, when someone says we want to build, and we're, we're going to hear from, in our next meeting, we're going to hear from a professor at Penn State who's going to talk about uh, using computational uh, materials design and engineering to find photoelectrodes for water splitting. But today we're going to get a, a, a very a broad-based uh, conversation from Aziz or discussion from Aziz about this whole topic. And I got to say that I think Quest Tech is one of the, it probably the pioneer in this area in terms of corporate America. And I'm just delighted, Aziz, to have you with us today. I look forward to your talk, and I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions and answers. So let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, and greetings, everyone from Evanston, Illinois. Uh, the topic that I'd like to talk about today relates to integrated computational materials engineering known as ICME and the design and deployment of advanced materials. Uh, this is how we practice it at Questec. Let me get this. Let's see. Uh, you Bye. know what, we, we cannot hear you at the moment, is he? Oh, you can't hear me either. <laughs> okay, now I can. Okay, and let me see if I can. Uh, Set the arrow. Well, the arrow on your keyboard. Your 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 audio is pretty good right now, actually. I know, but I'm trying to move the screen. The, oh, the next. Yeah. Go to next. Yeah. This second, I'm a. Yeah, that's tech support here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there. there you go, good. <laughs> All right, so with that, uh, basically we'll try to share with you who we are at Questec, what we do, and then a brief description of the ICME technology and how it's practiced at some companies. Uh, then uh, looking, uh, mentioning to you where we fit within the US Materials Genome Initiative. Some of you may be familiar with that. Then an illustration on how our advanced alloy is designed using this ICME technologies. And then comments about materials informatics and the ICMD, the Integrated Computational Materials Design Predictive Software Platform. Then comments on how some of those advanced materials can address environmental challenges and moving toward uh, net zero carbon emission as an example. So with that, Questec uh, International, uh, we are the 100% owner of Questec Innovations uh, in USA in Evanston. Uh, we are 50% partner with Questec Europe uh, based in Stockholm mm -hmm. and uh, with Thermocalc Software Company and uh, also 50% owner of the joint venture in Questec Japan KK in Tokyo with the CTC Itochu company. Um, the company started by Professor Greg Olson, who is now at MIT. 
1996 with his uh, graduate student, Dr. Charlie Kuman, and later on I'll explain the connection. Presently, uh, Charlie is the VP of Materials Technology at both SpaceX and Tesla. I think he is one of the two people that are employees of both companies, he and uh, Elon Musk. Uh, the expertise we have is in materials by design, with material science, metallurgical engineering, uh, working with uh, predictive type software. Uh, and uh, we dealing mostly with metallic materials, various alloys, but we also had project in uh, bulk metallic glasses and polymers. Uh, we're privately held company. 80% uh, of the company is owned by employees. Uh, it consists of 19 PhDs in material science, and 22 engineers in metallurgy and computer science. Uh, we have a board of seven individuals, five are PhDs in material science, three are MIT alumni, and four of the board members are members of the US National Academy of Engineering. So what is it we do? The Questac scientists basically we design prototype and deploy advanced materials based on the integrated computational engineering, as well as the accelerated insertion of materials method methodologies. Uh, we have over now 26 years of R&D and more than 600 funded projects where we actually collected a lot of proprietary tools, genomic database, uh, material science uh, data sets, physics-based models, and vetted simulation. And these are the foundation of our Questec predictive software capability. Actually, materials by design is one of our trademarks, and it simply stated is designing materials microstructure and altering it at the atom level. Wow. Now, uh, Ron hinted that uh, Questec is considered a pioneering uh, ICME. Actually, the first alloy ultra high strength steel ferrium S53 is the first alloy to be computationally designed from a clean sheet of paper and qualified to fly. And that was flying in 2010 uh, on the T-38 Air Force trainer as a landing gear. The design of it was to address issues with uh, stress corrosion cracking of landing gears, but also to eliminate the toxic uh, cadmium plating on many of those ultra high strength steel to minimize uh, the uptake of hydrogen into the material with, via corrosion. Uh, also, it will be the one uh, on the Dragon uh, capsule when it will land on Mars. It's right now on uh, several of uh, the landing component for SpaceX. Um, in terms of the impact of that technology, uh, here's the statement at the time from the U.S. Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, uh, where we designed the S-53. And uh, basically, not only it helped eliminate uh, or reduce dependency on cadmium plating, but also provided savings at the time estimated uh, to be close to $50 million. Uh, now we have uh, Japanese entities as well as European interested. And here's the statement from Dido Steel uh, that basically work with us and we assist them with our ICME approach that it really is helping them in terms of changing the way they think about materials design and development. When you get the driveway, call me. Uh, hello? Oh, okay, anyway, so uh, what is really uh, in terms of the impact of ICME as practice, but why we refer to it as uh, visionary companies. Uh, if you have an Apple Watch or an iPhone or an, I, uh, an Apple iPad, Basically, you already have a material that was designed computationally. And I'll illustrate that on the next slide. Uh, both Apple and SpaceX, as well as Tesla, uh, practice ICME in their, uh, what would be materials concurrency supporting their novel designs. 
This is from the news release from the MIT Department of Material Science and Engineering in February. And here's like an illustration. This is like around 2018, I guess. The note about Apple with Johnny Ive, the chief design officer, recognizing that Apple has metallurgists, which is kind of unusual for a consumer electronic company to speak about or have metallurgists. But these are the metallurgists to help redesign the anodizable aluminum on the watch, the new gold that they put on the watch. And when you look up the patent that now is signed to Apple, you will see the names, whether Dr. Feinberg or uh, Dr. Olson or Jim Wright, they're all the disciples of Greg Olson and his approach applying ICME to accelerate the design of novel materials. Uh, Charlie Kuhlman is also one of those uh, inventors recognized in these advanced materials design. Well, Charlie right now is at uh, SpaceX Tesla and he is creating a team, what they refer to it as cross company materials engineering team to help not only develop the alloys, but also the processes relying on advanced materials. Actually, the challenge he had from Elon Musk is, can he has this whole body of the car aluminum cast as one single piece instead of multiple pieces put together? And that's where they redesigned their casting line. It's known as the giga casting of aluminum with the redesigned aluminum to meet the process required. And this is one of the new concepts in engineering concurrency that is practiced by few companies where as they're redesigning an innovative part or product, they're combining it at the same time with the right material, the redesign to help achieve the performance they needed. Instead of like pick it up from existing materials, which might limit the performance of the component they're redesigning. Uh, that importance of materials, materials matter, was highlighted in 2011 by launching the Materials Genome Initiative, recognizing the importance of advanced materials in support of innovation. Also, the Japanese in 2016 uh, started or launched a report uh, that was, uh, I think, supported by Prime Minister Abe uh, cabinet, uh, looking at the importance of materials to the whole Japanese industry, specifically the structural materials. And also it was recognized in the US that to ensure competitiveness, you don't wanna bring job based on commodity materials that you still have to compete with outside entities, uh, foreign entities. But if you develop it with uh, advanced materials that would ensure uh, improved competitiveness <laughs> for the US manufacturing sector. So the Materials Genome Initiative was launched in uh, 2011, at the time uh, based from the president office, looking at how can uh, the US accelerate the development of advanced materials to, for competitiveness, uh, but at the same time, reducing the amount of time it takes, for example, to place a new material in an aerospace type application, it takes between 10 to 20 years by the time the materials is uh, developed to really flying in a safety critical component. And at the same time, not only they wanna reduce that time, but they wanna reduce the cost of making it because if you go at it empirically, you're trying so many different uh, options without really uh, being certain you're gonna hit the right one. Well, the Materials Genome Initiative is supportive of the MGI that was launched uh, in 2011. Actually, as we showed you already in 2010, we had met that uh, goal of the Materials Genome Initiative. Uh, so what is it about that Materials Genome Initiative? The best the description of it is uh, Professor Olson, the MIT, uh, professor of the practice, uh, uh, basically, you know, he looks at it as the MGI is developing fundamental databases of the parameters that really impact the assembly of the structure of materials. Just 
analog to the human genome project that was launched more than 30 years ago, uh, collecting or setting the databases that direct the assembly of the structure of life, and now is leading into all the scientific-based development uh, of uh, the novel med medicine. Uh, that's one way to look at it as the MGI is looking at uh, the assembly of the structure of materials uh, to uh, come up with advanced products. At Questec, in practicing it, we've been interacting with many entities, helping them solve their materials challenges. Uh, and what you see over there, for example, above the uh, rover on Venus, uh, Venus, while well, the name sounds nice, it's a very harsh uh, uh, environment over 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And many of the gears that should be powering vehicle like that made out of hardened steel uh, will really soften very quickly at any temperature above 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are using our frame C61 that will maintain its hardness and strength above the 500 degrees Fahrenheit that support the mission. The one below it is a picture of a gear that now being adopted on the far, the forward uh, Army Reconnaissance uh, helicopter that is made out of C-64 that has uh, providing about 20% improved power density, but more important, it continued to function beyond the eight minutes that it took the legacy material when uh, they lose the oil. That is, if shot at and uh, they lose the oil, the heat from the friction of the gears rotating would cause enough high temperature to soften the steel and the uh, aircraft will crash. The new C-64 that now is adopted for the new generation uh, not only provide the 80 the 20 percent increased power density but operated for over 80 minutes without uh, losing uh, its hardness and you're looking at it after that operation with uh, the after the loss of the oil it's still in a good condition the one on the right this is an application in oil and gas for a case runner where they are increasing the torque. However, when they went from 80,000, the torque force wanted to get to 100,000. Uh, the durability of the, the legacy material they were using uh, basically wasn't uh, uh, reliable. And they are using our M Ferium M54 in those applications. Um, over the years, as I mentioned, we have more than 600 projects we worked on. Uh, oh, we have uh, about 32 invention uh, as patent issued or pending. Uh, these materials were addressing applications, as I mentioned, related to heat resistance, as well as a lot of structural materials, uh, thermal management, uh, corrosion, uh, uh, radiation, uh, heat dissipation, or atmospheric degrade degradation. Uh, these are the number of projects that we had in these sectors or these uh, addressing these properties and the number of patents in light uh, color. And a lot of these were in support of the industrial sectors in aerospace and defense. But now we're seeing increased in the interest in additive manufacturing or the 3D printing of metals and alloys, as well as some medical device application, uh, thermoelectric uh, and hypersonic. So now, how does this work? And here I, uh, I apologize if I uh, confuse you with some of the details, I'll try not to. But when we worked on the landing gear uh, where the issue was stress corrosion cracking failures, which was estimated in a corrosion study around uh, trying to think 19, and, well, maybe 92, identified the military is costing them over $200 million per year on uh, fixing the problem and replacement. Uh, and that's where one of the alloy we showed you in the landing here addressed that with improvement for the Air Force. Uh, but the interest also was by the Navy 
Nav Air had issues with the stress corrosion cracking of the ultra high strength steel. Uh, let me back here. What you're looking at the upper right hand side is more of an illustration. It is mostly intergranular stress cracking. So the idea is, can we address the issue of the intergranular stress corrosion cracking of the, like the 300M raging steel, which basically has been a legacy alloy since the 1960s. It has good or a very good high strength, uh, acceptable fracture toughness as K1C. However, it's not that great in terms of resisting stress corrosion cracking as mostly intergranular. The improvement on it came in the 1980s uh, with the AMS 6532 ultra high strength steel offered similar strength, uh, much improvement in the fracture toughness in air more than double. However, when tested for K1 SCC, it's a slight improvement. And the way that it was redesigned empirically was to add even more cobalt, which considered by the military a strategic material. So with that, the challenges to us was, can we address this problem for nav air? And uh, the way we work at it, typically the material materials industry will start from left to right. That is, they already have process, they have a material with chemistry, they recognize the microstructure, they set the properties, and then it could be designed for some performances. Uh, we rely on the reverse, which is looking at what is it, the performance that are required. And the idea would be, well, what do you need as properties and how those properties, what kind of microstructure you it's required to achieve those properties and how this can fit within the processing parameters that are set by the client. Uh, this is known as the reciprocity principle by Professor uh, Cohen at MIT. So, to address the interest of nav air, they definitely wanted on the right side the performance, high strength, improved SCC, a resistance to stress corrosion cracking, and lower cobalt content if possible. So, for that, we start with Professor Olson chart, the way he teaches it at MIT for his design course. Identifying definitely the strength is an important property, the toughness, but also looking at specifically at the hydrogen resistance to hydrogen stress cracking. These are tied with the lines that you see connecting lines are to models. Let's say modeling the strength based on what we selected would be martensitic structures with secondary precipitates, strengthening precipitates. Uh, the toughness is related to grains. Uh, the, the grain sizes, uh, as well as looking at uh, the amount of austenite within that martensitic structure. And for the hydrogen resistance to hydrogen, since it's mostly intergranular, we tie it to the cohesive energy of the grain boundary. And I'll come back to that to illustrate then how we work with that. Then all of these are tied with uh, simulations to what would be the processing parameters from the the established chemistry to the melting refining to the various heat treatment uh, uh, and processing as well as tempering. So now, uh, just as a simple illustration, since it's mostly intergranular, so the idea would be to find out with alloying elements or solute, uh, what are the those additional elements that will have tendency to migrate to the grain boundary. That is the segregation energy driving force moving to the grain boundary. And then once at the grain boundary, does it act to increase the cohesive strength or decrease it? And with that, uh, looking at the cohesive strength, we looked at, at the parameter established by the uh, rice wang model. So with the existing data, there's a lot of experimental data that illustrate the, the role of so, solute element in increasing embrittlement or decreasing it. And like specifically, phosphorus is known to increase tendency for embrittlement, while, for example, boron in specific amount uh, is recognized empirically to improve uh, uh, or reduce the embrittlement sensitivity. 
Uh, now for alloying element, there are data available, but not on all the elements that we, you know, we felt we should consider. So for that, we rely on a theoretical calculation based on the density functional theory uh, that will allow us to identify the effect of alloying element, let's say in an iron base, the Fe sigma three. So what you're looking at will be data calculated that we, you know, in our uh, data set that, for example, illustrate that mercury on the upper right hand side will definitely increase the potency for embrittlement. Uh, on the left hand side, for example, uh, it could be other element like magnesium for that steel. On the other side, if you look at the lower uh, the element with providing uh, lower tendency for the or potency for embrittlement would be like tungsten, rhenium, uh, molybdenum, vanadium, uh, niobium. So the idea would be recognizing all of that. How would you redesign computationally a material that provides you the optimum of having element at the grain boundary increasing the cohesive strength? Uh, the combination could exceed over 200,000 possibilities, so supercomputers will be required. Mm -hmm. However, we could narrow it down with science, material science based insight into 10 or 12 that will allow us to identify a chemistry that, by the way, you notice like cobalt and nickel don't play that much of an impact. So we could look at readjusting the amount of cobalt this way. So the answer with all of that, so I was simplifying it, is what led us to the design of the ferium M54 with about half of the amount of cobalt with the same ultra high strength slightly above, but also with the same fracture toughness. However, when it came to measuring, measurement for stress corrosion cracking is about five times better than the materials that they were using uh, by nav air. And I'll show you what was the application. It's in the hook shank, the one that is lowered when the F-18 is landing on an aircraft carrier, it has to catch uh, one of the cables to come to arrest uh, the existing legacy material was basically qualified for a thousand arrests. However, unfortunately, some of it would fail within 800 unexpectedly. And that impact readiness where they have to examine all the hook shanks on existing uh, planes. The material, the M54, uh, was tested and basically recognized for over 2,300 arrests without fracture. The Navy placed an order for 60 hook shanks with us that with the new material that resulted in over $3 million estimated <laughs> savings by the Navy. And the alloy actually is now uh, a poster child of a success of the materials genome initiative because it's from a clean sheet paper to qualification and flight. It was in less than seven years. And the Navy recognizing that potential of the predictive design of materials, relying on material science and ICME to a point where now they, uh, uh, sent a note throughout that air that anytime they got problems with the stress cracking of 300 M, uh, they can uh, drop replace with M54 without, as long as it's the same design, same part, without the need for any further testing and evaluation. So that's one illustration of the impact of ICME in terms of creating or developing, designing novel materials and deploying them. So the way we view it, and I think Ron was alluding at uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. If we look at the field of materials, the materials informatic, definitely on the left-hand side, there are a lot of data now being sorted out and curated as well, not only experimental, but as well as calculated that would help in uh, developing simulation or an artificial intelligence that would lead to machine learning. So you should be able to push a button and get the material you obtain that you desire. But most of that will be helping in discovering compound uh, of interest without the need for any specific insight on how did it work. What we practice is on the right-hand side, which is we work with vetted 
data, genomic data based on the calculated phase diagrams. And we also rely on data from the high throughput, but we're subjected to uncertainty quantification. So we, we know that basically uh, the percentage of certainty in what we're using as material, as uh, input data. And then we apply our materials by design, which is a physics-based models, tools in it. And that's what is allowing us to work within this integrated computational materials uh, predictive software platform that not only discover novel materials, design it, but also accelerate the deployment because it was a whole system approach as we're developing the material. Uh, now, 10 years after the, the 2011 uh, launch of the Materials Genome Initiative, there was a review by uh, the subcommittee uh, looking at, well, what's the next 10 years? And the report came out in November of uh, 2021. And one of the items in it they highlighted is the materials in innovation infrastructure. And they recognize that for such an in integrated platform needed for the innovation in infrastructure, they need to bridge the gap from discovering materials to actually deploying. So there was a need identified for integrated materials uh, platform that will help bridge that gap. And uh, actually what I wanna share it with you is what we're doing now within Questec moving forward. Within our 26 years of expertise, know-how in applying materials by design, uh, we are putting together this integrated computational materials design, the ICMD platform that would allow us to disseminate that information uh, to people interested in looking at advanced or innovative materials. And that would help expand the ICME technologies, but not only us working with it, but allowing other companies to practice ICME in their search for innovative materials, in a way, democratizing the ICME technology. Uh, and that's what this ICMD platform will offer, as well as will help uh, clients who may be mostly mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and others in designing a novel product to be able to work with the advanced materials that they can use via the, or the, work with via the ICMD. And that has been part of the growth for uh, the 3D printing of metals, because many of those people practicing that may not be the PhDs in material science, but the ICMD would be a tool that would allow them to at least address that gap that they have, but they are excellent at using the CAM, the CAD and the design of uh, new ways of a product that could uh, provide uh, uh, weight reduction or enhanced power. Uh, we work a lot for the government. We got the numerous uh, projects, whether from the specific uh, sectors of the Defense Department, the Department of Energy, DARPA, uh, as well as uh, NIST and NASA. But also we have industrial clients that we work with uh, as they may have uh, specific challenges where we could practice our ICME working with them. Uh, now that's a very quick summary of what is it we do at Questec and illustration of design of materials. Can these, be, can these advanced materials help within the environmental issues? Uh, what you're looking here is an example of an, uh, higher, uh, an aluminum alloy that can operate at increased uh, temperature than the existing operation designed with aluminum alloys based on the multi-component, the L1-2 structure, uh, phase structure. Uh, we are looking at a component that is built additively, the lower left-hand side of this aluminum alloy. Most aluminum alloys, let's say the cylinder head on a car, uh, they operate at, as best at about 200, 220 degrees centigrade. If they can increase that performance of the aluminum alloy to 300 or 310 <clears throat> degrees centigrade, uh, Audi estimated they can reduce the emission 
for the same power density uh, by about close to 38%. So that higher temperature aluminum alloy as casting or 3D printing will offer this opportunity. The other one I mentioned, the C64 in improving the power density, and that could be a great consideration for the wind turbine specifically, wind turbine, uh, the upper box of uh, the gears, where to get to fix it, it really costs a lot of money. You have to bring a special rig uh, to take you up there. It costs about $110,000 per week. And uh, going up every few months to repair legacy materials that are failing, that C64 will provide uh, better reliability as it did for the military. And the other one, now we're working with a company from the startup MIT from the Boston area, uh, Boston Metals. They are now uh, looking at their technology in making steel as, as with zero carbon emission. It's a high temperature, molten type uh, electrolytic process. And the materials represent challenges. <clears throat> We're working with them in terms of looking at more durable alloys for that process. Uh, the other example would be the, uh, for example, mining may be impacting the environment or uh, sustainability. Uh, for example, the use of rare earth metal, one of the materials will be designed a single crystal. <coughs> Excuse me, will reduce the amount of rhenium addition from 6% to less than 2% for similar performance if we're using the ICME approach. Uh, the other one was a material redesigned for the military to lessen the weight of uh, what would be mortar gun that a soldier has to carry on his back or her back uh, would be if it's made out of titanium, but to be a lower cost that is using recyclable scrap. Actually, uh, we uh, designed it with lesser vanadium as one element in it. And now it's made as a wire for metal additive manufacturing. Uh, and the last one I mentioned, the steel for the increased service life for an oil and gas application. Uh, so in a way, <clears throat> as a small company out of Evanston, Illinois, we believe we're making a uh, materials impact on Earth, Venus, and pretty soon on Mars. So <laughs> with that, thank you for your attention and uh, <laughs> questions, hopefully without uh, you know, I hope I didn't confuse you with all of that, but uh, we have more on our website you could look for, and uh, we could, we'll be glad to connect with you or address other things you may have in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Aziza. I really, I really especially like your closing comment that you now have materials on Earth, Venus, and Mars. I, I think that's, that's a wonderful perspective. <laughs> but I, 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 uh, I think what we have just heard represents something of a what I would describe as a sea change in terms of uh, materials science and materials engineering, and I, I want to I want to put a little bit of a perspective on that, and then I have some a question that I'd like to pose to Aziz. You know, if let, let's suppose you are the developer of a new technology, and you decide that in order for this technology to function, you need to have a material that has properties that just don't exist today. Or alternatively, let's suppose you're the military and you've got a fleet of Navy uh, uh, aircraft that land on um, uh, uh, aircraft carriers and you're concerned about the problem of hydrogen embrittlement of the landing gear. And you heard Aziz talk about that. You know, the, the traditional approach to dealing with those kinds of questions is trial and error. You, you try material A, you put it in, into the laboratory, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't, you go back, try another material. Historically, that has, that has been the way we've approached these kinds of answers to these questions. It takes a long time. The R&D uh, from concept to uh, application can be as much as 20 years. Now, what we're seeing with technology of the kind that Aziz described, this computational materials design and engineering, is truly revolutionary because what we what we do, what material scientists and engineers at Quest Tech do and, and at other places, is they say, here's, here's the material. This is what we needed to do. 
Now we can we can develop from first principles models that that will describe that functionality. And then we have a database of information that has been collected for generations. How do we couple theory and this database in a way, in a computational means by machine learning that will allow us to answer the question, how do we generate the material to serve our needs? And moreover, how do we do it in a way that is half the time or less than the traditional trial and error approach? That is exactly what Aziz has been talking about. That is what Questech has pioneered. That is what the Material Genome Initiative is trying to uh, implement broadly in terms of technology, not only in the United States. And, and the Material Genome Initiative is focused in the US, but there are nations throughout the world that are now uh, developing their own comparable initiatives uh, using computational uh, design and engineering materials. So that, that's the perspective. That, that truly represents a sea change. Now, the question is, you, you, you've got to have confidence in the models that, that you use in order, and, and Aziz mentioned density functional theory, that, that's one of the models that is used in many of the, many of the applications that might be of interest. Uh, and you've got to be especially confident that the data you collected is authentic, it's meaningful, it's, uh, it's accurate, because you know, machines learn what they're given. And if you feed a machine incorrect information and data, it will give you incorrect answers. And so, Aziz, the question I have for you, and I mean, this is a very broad question for the whole effort in, in terms of this material, uh, computational materials uh, approach. How do you go about convincing you, you and your colleagues at Questec, how do you go about convincing yourself that you've got the very best models and more, more, probably more importantly, that you've got data that is authentic and meaningful and 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 uh, honorable data. How do you do that? Because that, that seems fundamental. Uh, well, one way to verify that the materials we designed with this integrated computational approach is meeting the properties with confidence. Uh, usually, uh, we have the example of M54 where for such materials to fly on the F-18, uh, you need about properties averaging from 10 different production heat, which is over 1,000 pounds each to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, it's costly and takes a lot of time. And then you look at the minimum design criteria from those 10 different products that you say, now with confidence, I can meet those design properties and exceed it, but that's the minimum of it. So that minimum design, uh, let's say strength, yeah. uh, an aerospace engineer or mechanical engineer will then design the component with, basically we were able to predict those from our ICME by looking only at three heats that were calibrated and we have 99% confidence in basically that minimum design strength that later on was verified by making 10 different production heats and coming up with those numbers. So we use that approach to make sure that uh, we're relying on our, on our own data that is vetted and that's in our own system, our data set. Okay. Right. We have to rely on outside data we have a, the process of uncertainty quantification that will allow us to say these type of data you're getting in are going to introduce that much of lack of confidence in what you're looking at later on for the certainty of yeah. the property. So, but then everything actually, there's still, it's vetted and verified, like in the case of the M54, after making the small buttons uh, of that chemistry, uh, we looked with the uh, atom probe to see did we really get the amount of tungsten we wanted at the grain boundary and was it there to help improve that cohesive strength. So yeah. there is a, a process of designing computationally, but also a checking it along the way. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, but the, if, and the knowledge comes in. 
we, we have a we have a number of hands up, and I, and I will go to them. But I just I just want to <laughs> emphasize though, you, you what you. You use data that you generated yourself, and so you therefore have confidence in it. But I think from a broader perspective, uh, you know, and I, you know that I chaired a committee of the National Academy that looked at the, the where the M Materials Genome Initiative has gone over the last ten years, and we were very concerned as a committee that much some of the data that is available in 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 the world, let's say, compendium of data. Is just not authentic, and so there, there's a tremendous need for uh, curation and uh, verification, uh, and that that had been uh, something that we we identified as being a problem that needs to be corrected. There's no doubt that it can be, but um, uh, it just it's just an issue that needs attention. And I I understand how you folks are doing it. I think that uh, that's a laudable way of doing it. I have it in uh, the appendix. Yeah, I know you're looking for something here, right? Uh, uh, here is we had this challenge from the Air Force, where they use 3D printing of Inconel 625. Yeah, no, <laughs> somewhere, huh? Yeah, yeah I want to show you that. Yeah, no, but back if you could back up toward the appendix. Basically, what they did, they built the component or the samples. And they tested the strength that they achieved. And what they did, they offered the challenge to all entities involved in machine learning, AI, and additive manufacturing, saying, yeah. can you tell us what are the, pro the tensile properties that we're obtaining? And all what they did, they offered the process parameters. That is, uh, the method of printing, uh, the time and temperature, in a way, that they had in that process, the laser ener energy density. Yeah. And we were able to predict what were the tensile properties, and we won that challenge, actually. Okay. Uh, based on get ready. I, I'm going to be in the office for another. Albert, Albert, time. could you mute? Sorry. There you go. I got it. Okay, you're set. But that's like an example of what you're asking. At least we met one of the challenges. Uh, kind of, but that's, again, using our own simulation and approach, yeah. uh, knowing the process parameters that we could predict what should be the properties of the finished component. Actually, mm -hmm. right now, the ICMD, what it does, it builds on the finite element, the FEM uh, software that is added to additive manufacturing. We add on top of it the material science-based ICMD because knowing from the design, the FEM, the location, spot and time and temperature via that building process, we could predict what the microstructure would be, which will allow you to predict what the tensile properties are going to be. Very good. So in a way, in that slide under materials informative, in AI machine learning as practiced by some entities, you don't need an insight into the material science of it. What we do is material science-based insight is needed to be confident in your predictive software. Very good. Let, let's go to the questions. We have a number of hands up. So Jenny, I think your, your hand was up first. Let's go. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Aziz, uh, thank you, good, uh, good to see you. And uh, thank you for the impact you made by using uh, methodology, methodological engineering. And the reason I mentioned that is, uh, yeah, as you know well, uh, methodology has not been the uh, most uh, demanding field in the U.S. Uh, recent, you know, say 20 years or so, but has been uh, very strong, continued strong in the countries like Japan and uh, and China. So in that sense, you know, we may have a little bit of a challenge in the competitive side, but I'm glad you were, you know, pursuing the methodology, all this uh, thermodynamic kinetic theories. I have a couple of questions. Actually, I have a number of questions. Let me bundle a couple of them together. Uh, I think that's probably what Ron alluded is that uh, uncertainty. So um, the, the computational uh, uh, material design, the, the, I think the ultimate goal is really to have a uh, reliable prediction of uh, in the entire life cycle of the material and also hopefully to have a feedback loop 
you know, to the to the continued of the uh, developments. I just like to see what your technique you use. I, I think you you also discussed already, you know, some of the uh, different steps uh, you 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 use to uh, to uh, to justify the confidence level. Uh, just like the AI today, we talk about a lot of uh, justified confidence. You know, so uh, what kind of technique do you use? You know, in the uh, uncertainty quantification, it, uh, in, in, in that sense, it, and uh, uh, also to get a, uh, real life into consideration. Are you also using multi-scale uh, approach, or you just kind of one one scale, and then to make all the say uh, you know predictions and uh, and the models. Uh, well, now let me stop here first. <laughs> let me see if I answer the last part. Yes, we design at a multi-scale level. That is, we design first looking at the atoms, the interaction between atoms and what, what it will do to the microstructure. But then we take it to from the nano level, if you want to refer to it this way, or the atomic level, to the micro level. And in the micro level, we verify and the atom level we verify with the advanced unit which we don't have we use northwestern university uh, like let's say the atom probe for the microstructure we have tools within the scanning microscope and others that we could also examine are we getting what we wanted in great size orientation and others and then there is the meso level which is the mechanical property and others that you could measure so the the system approach of greg olson chart is looking at all those levels actually connecting them so we use that now as to the uncertainty quantification uh, we have a project working on the algorithm for that. I really don't have all the details and I'll probably confuse you more if I try to get into it and confuse myself. But that's, we got two PhDs people uh, working on uh, the algorithm related to the uncertainty quantification. Okay. Well, thank you. I have one question, but I will, I will yield at this point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I might just add that uh, we have the CEO talking to CEO in that exchange. Jenny is the CEO of a okay. company called the H Technologies Group. And uh, Jenny, can you just give us a short statement of what H Technology does? Uh, yes, uh, H Technology uh, is one of the actually spin off company. We used to be a, a uh, manufacturing company, uh, more electronics hardware, electronics uh, materials as well. So, you know, such as if you look at the iPhone and on that, all the manufacturing technology we, we, we've been involved in. Uh, but the more the, uh, recent uh, uh, years, we spin off the manufacturing. So right now it's more kind of advisory. We look at the new and the emerging technologies, uh, <laughs> even outside of the microelectronic electronic industry, basically much broader based uh, looking at the the technologies. That's what our current state of uh, business we, we focus on. But we still link to with manufacturing. That's a spin off. We are uh, the prior partner uh, in manufacturing, in, in, uh, working on that on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, so once you get up manufacturing, you get a little more time to think about many other things. <laughs> so good. many other you know areas of the uh, uh, industries. So. Thank you, Jenny. Let's see, uh, let's go to Al. Yeah, hi Aziz, a very impressive presentation. Congratulations for the accomplishment. Now, uh, I'm a modeler or reform modeler from years ago. And the question is when you have these different model, these models at different scales, how is it going from one scale to the other? Is it going smoothly or you guys have to interject with a lot of um, intuition, et cetera? And how is all that captured in your tool platform? Well, let's say for a strength model, there is more than one single model describing the strength uh, that you could use. Uh, we like look at which one is more uh, compatible with what we're planning on designing in terms of uh, material science-based model type, as well as physics-based. So you could be have a, looking at a strength model based on grain size. There's the old formula that people use. 
uh, inverse of a grain size. You could look at basically the orientation within the grain and uh, uh, what would be compatibility in a way. So uh, I'm not the one who works with all of that, but I know that we look at several models and uh, we work with the one that fit the best for us. Like I remember when we looked at the hot cracking issue in printing aluminum uh, alloys, there was a uh, hot cracking sensitivity. So you could look at the mechanistic type model as well as you could look at a physics-based model in the solidification and the stresses that is created during the solidification process. Uh, and uh, that's where you kind of like uh, readjust it to the aluminum system you're working with. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, but your answer is within one scale. Yeah. Uh, my, my concern is when, if you start at the atomic level, how do you go from that to nano to grain level, et cetera? Is that done smoothly? Well, the prediction of it, like I mentioned, if you rely on a cohesive energy, then you could sit what you could see what you designed at the atom interaction level that is measured in a way or recognized uh, by uh, the strength along the grain boundary that you could measure via like a fracture mechanic. So you're not testing it as two atoms. There are no instruments that will allow you to verify how you could measure that. Uh, you could use the Schrodinger equation to estimate yeah. <laughs> the, the strength between the two atoms, but the, the, I don't know how you could measure it, but you could measure it at, let's say, the micro scale uh, instead of the nano scale. Yeah. You know, so just the way you know, try to vet it as you move, as uh, Jenny was uh, alluding to, at the different scale levels to see what physically you could really recognize with the instrumentation you have, you could measure versus what. Uh, scientifically, you would have, in a way, uh, not guessed, but uh, figure out what should be the strength. You know, just to add a just to add a comment, uh, Albert. I, you know, about ten years ten years ago, we we reached an important convergence in terms of science and technology related to materials. First of all, there were incredible modeler because of the computational capacity. Modelers just blossomed, and and at the same time experimental technologies that had atom order resolution came on the market, became available. And so we have this interesting convergence of high quality modeling and high resolution experimental, uh, atom order experimental techniques. And it allowed this transition from atom order to micro to macro to mesoscale uh, uh, continuity. And it, it's really quite impressive. But it's a very long story. And I, I think he's given you a, a good beginning to that answer, but it's a very long story. Well, glad to hear. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll work on that one. Okay. Ron, may I say something? I just wanted to let you know, I have a hard stop at 11 o'clock our time, 12 o'clock your time. Yeah, no, we'll finish it. We'll finish it. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah, that's waiting it. for me to catch a flight. <laughs> I know, I got you. No, we always finish at noon. No, let's go to let's go to Eddie. Eddie, you're muted. Yeah. Yes. Um, actually, I'm going to put on my reliability hat, um, which is uh, one of the areas that I, I was involved with. Um, when you actually design these materials, uh, there are several issues when you translate that material into design products. Um, the one that you showed me with, for example, Tesla's single body immediately put hairs up on my head <laughs> uh, for uh, reliability issues. As soon as you have a crash, how are you going to handle it? Um, you know, do you replace the entire body, for example? Um, so when you design materials uh, for specific uh, end products, uh, do you also look at, for uh, example, um, uh, do, you, do you have ideas of how you can accelerate life testing for, uh, in, uh, for these materials and for these kinds of products? Uh, do you uh, think about perhaps a mix of materials? Uh, in other words, there's a whole ancillary section to my mind that if you're going to 
take materials, you want to translate them into products. Um, and, uh, you know, so what is the best design features that you would, uh, uh, or the best material match to, to designs, uh, taking into account perhaps a, a, a greater, uh, more universal aspect of, of, of where you're going to apply these. Do, do, do you uh, actually see some kind of added value to uh, additional um, capabilities to, to what you're actually doing in that regard? Let me see if I can answer it, uh, you know, or at least what I understood you're asking. Uh, actually, we had a case where it relates to automotive and crash testing. Uh, the idea is for any new model uh, to be approved by for transportation, uh, it has to pass specific crash tests. Now, in Japan and in Europe, compared to the US, the automotive manufacturer basically work with design companies that design the new model. At least they exp explain what is it they look for in the new model, the shape, the uh, whatever quality in it. And that design company, like one of them we interacted with, is called EDAG in Germany. It's a pretty big corporation. Yes, and basically they will design and build about five cars to provide the crash test, recognizing that fine, it will pass the criteria. So now the manufacturer can make you know large number of those cars. Well, the trouble is what's economic for them because the entity involved in right. supplying the steel for that new model uh, felt to make the various pieces that is collected in the body of the car to run the crash test, they have to develop dies for almost each one of those pieces, a die that costs over $100,000 to make five pieces, for example. Well, it's not economically feasible. And it dawned on them, well, what if we build all these small components to be put together to run the crash test out of additive manufacturing? And when they approached us, challenging us, they had uh, uh, the report in Japan about Quest that can do similar things. We worked with them, and that was the concept for the beginning of this ICMD platform software. We developed what they refer to it as AQC, uh, Accelerated Qualification and Certification of component. And the idea now, going back to the Ashby diagram, you got different steels of different ductility and strength, and you got many of them. Can you narrow down those to maybe one or two type of steels that based on changing the structure of those materials can meet the property for each part that you were basically building? And uh, the idea would be a lot of the printing machine would have a problem to just print with multiple type chemistries. It'd be better if you narrow it down to one chemistry. And we did that. Actually, we came up with two types of chemistries. And the idea now in the design, you could figure out for that piece where you want it to be weakened, where you want it to be strengthened, because the design that they make is for that energy. The crash energy has to be absorbed in specific component mm. of the car and not by the passengers in the car. So all of that was the initial concept that we worked with a huge corporation, Mitsubishi, uh, in Japan, that put us in touch with EDAG in Germany to help solve or address that material challenges for meeting specific properties in a design. I hope that answers or give you an idea about the related to the question that you're asking. It, it, it does a little bit. Um, I, I guess uh, the question really is an optimization of design with respect to materials um, and at the same time uh, confirming those designs and those materials through say accelerated life testing and I suppose my part of my question is uh, once you've designed a material and once you've identified uh, an application uh, do you also take a look at how you may uh, validate that that application. I think you kind of answered it, but I'm not sure if it is completely answered. Well, the validation is almost in the, what is it? The proof of the pudding is in eating it. The validation is in right making the component and following its performance. 
uh, like for example, one of the concepts of additive manufacturing is design the uh, personnel armor uh, vest, for example, and it can be designed with specific uh, strengthening and weakening part of that vest. Well, the ultimate test would be you wear it as the designer and have the people shoot at you and see if it you know, does. I, I, think, I think just, just to add a comment, I, I think a lot of the orientation might involve standards and testing that that, that we haven't really touched on today. Yeah, right. So, but but we can come back to that at another point. I want to, we have two more hands up and we're running out of time. So let, let's move on yeah. to Avi. Uh, okay, your, your analysis is very interesting, but focused on the characteristics of metals, ductility, strength, things like that. Two possible applications come to mind as a question mark. Has this technique been applied, say, to coming up with new batteries, electric batteries, uh, for use in uh, auto, everything from automobiles to any other storage system. And the other is biological, the biological domain. Could this technique be applied to come up with everything from, say, artificial cartilage to, uh, to organs that uh, could be used in replacement uh, of failing organs in, in people? Biologically, we really haven't been into that field. I know one of the the student for, uh, of Greg Olson looked at one of the projects they had. I'm not sure it was more of a university research. We haven't practiced uh, that part of it. In terms of the battery, yeah, there are many ways we could use that technique specifically if you're looking for uh, the appropriate uh, cathode material. Right now, the most reliable that, or effect, effective one that people use are the cobaltite, the cobalt oxide. Uh, some people dabble with iron base and now they shift it to some nickel and cobalt. There are many options you could use, let's say with manganese and others, that you could look at a computational design of that. We don't have a project in that direction. Mostly it's the Argonne National Lab that is working in that direction, Lawrence Livermore Lab uh, for the uh, lithium ion type batteries. But we believe it could be uh, applied or uh, uh, address, for example, uh, since instead of having a uh, tunnel type uh, for the, uh, the lithium to go in and out, uh, would you be able to use a planar one, but strengthening the planes or the space between the planes uh, with specific atoms, uh, that could be kind of looked at computationally and then vetted or verified after. I would think also it could be this technique, almost the genome technique, could be applied in the biological domain as well. Entirely different criteria, but yeah. It, so far, our approach to medical was to figure out a way to enhance the opacity of implant materials because when a doctor is trying to place it in a human body and looking at the screen, they want to see clear type. Uh, mm -hmm. A picture of that piece they're putting in so they don't rupture or uh, bother <laughs> other part of the body. The other one, we have the shape memory alloy uh, that is used in the heart uh, placement as a stent where uh, basically it's in a coil similar to a tube. You pull it as a wire and as it's inserted near the heart by changing the temperature, it remembers its original shape, which was a tube and becomes a tube. And that's how you place it inside the artery near the heart. So these are, uh, we have a design that improved on the strength and the fatigue property, since there's a lot of uh, cyclical stresses on that component. But that not in working with uh, biological strength, right. with molecule. We're working with atoms that are minerals or the way if you want to <laughs> yes. metallic atoms. I, you know, I ju just again to add a footnote, I, I know that when, when the committee that I mentioned earlier met, we did, there, there are people, Avi, working on biological materials. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what Aziz has described is a sea change in terms of metallurgical applications and materials. But, but, but the Materials Genome Initiative has a very broad agenda, and it does include some biological materials. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to circulate a copy of the report of the committee. That way you'll be able to read it. <laughs> well, let me well, go you, on. To... You were the chairman, if I recall, with those recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me go, let me go on to uh, uh, Michael. Uh, you, Michael, you have the final question because I do want to let 
uh, Aziz meet his uh, calendar schedule. So you have the final question and we have about five minutes. It's a quick one. Um, okay. Just very quickly, how did you uh, form your company as an ESOP or did you distribute your shares to your employees? Uh, that's uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the history of the company. Hopefully we'll not record it then. <laughs> but uh, uh, the company started by the professor and his student and joined by a fellow who is uh, uh, Ray Ginelli, is one of the co-founders, who basically uh, arranged and helped in terms of getting projects which paid for the work, but then for investors. So by the, within 19, uh, within 2000, there were several investors within the Chicago area that raised about, well, close to maybe over a million dollars to continue with the work. Now, a big event happened, and I have to be careful on how to phrase it in 2012. You may recall there was the issue of the bend gate of the Apple phone, where if you put it in your back pocket and you sit, it might bend. And the mm -hmm. aluminum backing of it was soft. So Apple was interested in uh, basically coming up with higher strength aluminum, but it has to be consumer appeal that is compatible with the anodizing process to give you the oxide film on the aluminum that reflect the color. The point is to strengthen it, you put precipitate in it and change the microstructure, but then you have differential electromotive uh, potential <laughs> between the precipitate and the bulk. So when you're anodizing, you may create a rough surface like a moon crater type. So the idea was to redesign with alloying element that will provide you pretty close compatible uh, electrochemical potential that will allow the, the anodizing. And that's the pattern that I showed you on the anodizable aluminum. Well, it was to a point where uh, Apple liked that and they acquired the company and moved the 13 PhD teams to Cupertino. That's why I... I came in and that Dr. Olson did not want to change it. He told him you could do with the company what you want. He and I were in the same department at MIT the same years. I had retired way, way back when I graduated. I worked for Cabot Corporation, then a chemical company, Carlos Corporation. So he asked me when I come from retirement and restart the company. So now what you're seeing now, we're over 40 people and involved with more materials than just aluminum. So, so that, it's a privately owned by the employees. Uh, there's three major owners that present over 60%. So any decision moving forward in financing will be made. Uh, we're profitable. We're one of those companies that uh, we have line of credit. We haven't used for 10 years. Uh, we generate enough profit to support all that, like the development of the platform. And we're working now uh, with uh, interested venture capitals who really want to join looking at the software component as well as this. In other words, we're moving from just being a service component to be able to offer the ICMD as a software component that people can subscribe to it because we recognize the need and that's where the potential is. And to accelerate it, uh, there are some venture capitals looking at working with us. We haven't done that yet, but kind of like we're opening the door. But so far, we didn't need financial at one time. Now to accelerate that moving forward with the company uh, venture, we're not interested in private equities because they look at it as just a multiple of EBITDA or something like that. This yeah. is the potential for the future and not, we are now good enough, they can buy us with our own money in a way. I understand. That leads me just to my second question really quickly. I see in talking about your adding materials, some of that might be parts per thousand, I would assume. When you're talking about uh, relieving intergranular stresses, it implies that the final alloy has to be extremely homogenous. Did you have trouble translating from the laboratory to actually producing materials at the mill and getting those levels of homogeneity, or did you have some issues there? Thank you for the question, because it will help me now bring you back to the Olson chart, where it's a system approach. So as you're designing at the nano scale to the micro scale, you're paying attention on how can you achieve that from the alloying element, the refining of the steel or the nickel base super alloy mm -hmm. to the melting, remelting to the forging. Yeah, we account for all of that. These were all the lines are the simulations for that. 
because in one of the steel, for example, the company in Austria didn't have furnaces that can operate at the temperature you want to homogenize mm -hmm. it at. So now we have to redesign it for their oh. specific purpose. So while the US company that licensed it could do it, the Austrian company had limitations. So that's where the ICME comes in. It will help you with that flexibility. That's great. Thank Folks, you. We, 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 need to, we need to bring this to a close and let our speaker get to his next appointment. But I, I, just, I just want to close by saying, Aziz, that what, what you have given us is an indication of what I, I really do consider a sea change, both in terms of materials, engineer, uh, materials uh, engineering and production, but also material science and engineering education. Yeah, uh, I mean, if I, if I may close run with the comment, it's yeah. not about discovery. You could discover many planets. Can you go there? Oh, yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> That's the overcoming. But the point is, it's about discovery, design, yeah. and deployment. I mean, all that science really has <laughs> to have a, a useful engineered product. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, material, the human genome has to have the right medicine with it and not just a collection of data based on humans. So uh, that's where that system approach is needed and the science-based and physics-based are needed as insight to turn it into a useful engineered product. You're absolutely right. Aziz, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for yourself. Everyone, safe we'll, we'll travel, meet. safe travel, Aziz. Thank you very much. Yeah, Aziz. We'll meet Great again in two weeks. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.